live from Miami Beach, Florida, extracting the signal from the noise. It's the Cube, covering dot next conference. Brought to you by Nutanix. Welcome back to Steamy Miami, everybody. Stu and I are really pleased to have Dan Gorman on. He's an enterprise infrastructure architect, IT expert. Dan, great to see you. Thanks Thank for coming you. to theCUBE. Thank you for having we me. We found out your brother is a, is a CUBE alum as well, so that's, that's awesome. Yes. So, uh, first of all, your thoughts on this conference. Next, we were talking offline, you go to several of these you know, a year, which is, you know, I think you said five a year, which is a lot for Correct. An, an IT practitioner. So, where do you put next? Where do you, what do you think about the, the Nutanix event? Yeah, so, so first off, I think that this event is absolutely extraordinary. Uh, I've never seen this amount of attendees in a, in a first conference in my career. Uh, and that should tell you a little bit about the infrastructure uh, that Nutanix has and the software that they're doing. Um, I, I think it's absolutely uh, revolutionary uh, in, what, in the market. I think they're challenging a lot of the norms. Uh, and I think they're bringing a, an approach to the industry uh, that is, that is uh, really transformational. So you know, obviously, VMware very well. You're experienced expert in that in that space, and VMware, phenomenal. The the enormity of that trend, and, and but essentially, we were talking earlier, Stu and I, about what VMware essentially did is take a mess of infrastructure that was just incredibly inefficient and make it more efficient um, and relatively less complicated, but still very complicated. Correct. What is where does Nutanix fit in terms of? Relative to that sort of state of infrastructure today, what, what, is, what do you see as the Nutanix offering? So, so I think VMware has done a lot of great things and have a lot of great products. Uh, bringing the hypervisor to the market was, was truly transformational. I think the industry has moved past that and that's sort of the norm, the commoditization of that. Um, and, and starting to move the infrastructure to an abstraction model where you can move the, the, the apps in and out of environments, you can uh, move your infrastructure in and out of hypervisors, uh, but VMware really led that way, and now we're ready to do the sort of the second coming of infrastructure. So I have to ask you then, is it from a practitioner's perspective, VMware will talk about making infrastructure invisible, they'll talk about simplifying everything, orchestration, management, they'll talk about, they'll even talk about multi-clouds, they'll talk about OpenStack, embracing Docker, et cetera. So what's different? So, Nutanix is bringing web scale and invisible infrastructure to the enterprise. Historically, it was very brittle to manage, very brittle to use. You had to have SMEs in those areas. You had to build sort of the business around that when the business might not actually be in the business of doing that. Nutanix is bringing the, the simple point and click uh, uh, enterprise scale out uh, uh, web scale methodology uh, that, that's been around forever and they're the pioneers of that. Okay, so they're, they're early. But won't the big oligopoly and the monsters, the whales of the industry just sort of do their own version of that? Will, will, they, will they catch up or are they, are, they, are they doing that on infrastructure and software that is, that is too difficult to transform? So I, I think each manufacturer is going to want to make sure that people are in their own ecosystem. Uh, and, and that makes them somewhat biased. Uh, Nutanix is allowing you to say, hey, I don't care what ecosystem you're in, we're bringing that web scale, you can live with, within whatever ecosystem you'd like. Um, and, and competitors will have uh, similar platforms, Evo Rail is, is one of them, but you're locked into the VMware uh, VTAX uh, uh, or VCN6 and, and now you're in that, that swim lane. Uh, and, and some customers may not want to have that and have the choice to be able to move around. Well, v Vinod Kosla this morning was saying, hey, most customers are risk averse, so they'll you know, keep buying what doesn't get them fired. What do you mean by the VTAX? Can you explain that to our audience? So, so the enterprises generally, in most cases, have uh, um, a, a buyback, uh, chargeback model where they'll uh, essentially resell that, the infrastructure back to their internal units. And um, all those costs, support costs from, from the hypervisor uh, to the support of that, to the infrastructure, that all adds into that. And, most enterprises will want to collapse that as much as possible to stay competitive with other public cloud offerings. Uh, it's important that in, in some cases where requirements uh, require the uh, uh, users to stay on-prem, that that is a, a cost point that's attractive. You know, I remember going back to the first cube we did at VMworld was in 2010 and cloud was a big topic. 
at the time. Everybody was saying, what's cloud? Let's try to define cloud. You know, Amazon was doing its thing and, and, and all the enterprise guys were saying, no, we're cloud too. And I remember at the time talking to IT practitioners like yourself saying, you know, how are you going to keep pace with Amazon? How are you going to fund that? How are you going to afford it? And the answer was, well, we're not going to do it alone. We're going to look for partners to do it. And uh, Nutanix is a company that's, that's executing mm -hmm. uh, on that. Correct. Is that the right way to think about it? Are you essentially building, as an IT practitioner today, think about your, your, your colleagues, are you guys building essentially a, an internal cloud that is Amazon-like? Correct. In, in, in the core components of that is having a partner that will, will work with uh, uh, us as an org, um, where we can say, we want to build a cloud that is scalable, it's elastic, it will ebb and flow as our business needs change. And Nutanix has, has been a, a perfect partner for that. So, so, so in thinking about that sort of theme, do you feel like when you see you and your colleagues talking to your business con constituents, do you get pressure to do the public cloud? Whether it's Amazon, Azure, Google, do you get pressure to do public cloud? And are you able to credibly say, look, we can deliver the same types of services? Or do you say, you know what? For certain workloads, you should go to the public cloud. For others, here's why you should stay here. Can you help us sort of parse that? Yeah, so I think it's a little of both, honestly. Um, the, the biggest challenge is sort of the CRUD environment, the create, reuse, uh, uh, update, delete, where the developers want to move very quickly. Historically, uh, operations has a longer pull in terms of being able to deploy that infrastructure. Uh, building out a Nutanix infrastructure with something like orchestration automation allows you to sort of catch up to that uh, pace of development that the developers would like. Uh, in some cases, public cloud makes great sense. In some cases, you have to have it on-prem for certain business requirements. But you must be able to meet that uh, agility that public cloud can provide with all the enterprise security and, and components around that. So, so, so Dan, I'm, I'm curious, when you hear Nutanix talk about you know, just making infrastructure invisible, doesn't that obviate the need for an architect? <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully not. Um, but, but you still have to um, build the environment such that it can meet capacity needs. Um, Eventually, you want to be able to work in on higher order tasks. So an architect traditionally shouldn't be saying, you need this amount of spindles, you need this amount of CPU compute. We want to be working on the business challenges, things like uh, we have a feature or product X that needs to be deployed. Here's the infrastructure we need to do that. It can scale um, uh, as little or as much as we need. So I think the architect role changes a little bit. Yeah, I, I'd love to get your viewpoint because you know one, one of the big advantages you know we see to kind of this new style of architecture Nutanix, kind of all the Kuiper Converge is before, you used to say, okay, this year, go buy some servers. Next right. year, maybe it's time for storage. And predicting those individual silos was like impossible. Correct. And when you need to buy more, that migration upgrades, I mean, the whole thing is what I called, it was like the hamster wheel of pain. Right. Every step along the way, there's just pain and everything like that. Right. Um, does hyperconverge really make it easier, you know, Nutanix and, and, and the, the, these technologies specifically, um, to you know expand? And are there are there enough options out there that you can kind of build this for any application, or is there still work to do to mature that? So, so absolutely. And I think the, the the biggest challenges enterprise face, from my perspective today, is those big capex spends. Right, you come in the beginning of the year, you, you uh, throw down a couple million dollars, you try and anticipate what the year's growth is going to be. You may or may not hit that. The, the, the beauty with the Nutanix model is you can start with a minimum viable product. You say, I need a three or five node cluster. You, you might be fine, you might not, but if you have to expand, you can do it in chunks that are bite-sized. You're not doing these large capex outlays every time. And so I think the, the, the model from the enterprise web scale has, has changed that so that people's budgeting processes even change. We can say, hey, we can stop doing these big bang approaches and start scaling out our compute and storage in ways that are more appropriate for our business or our product needs. All right, so, so you throw out the word scale. I'm curious, you know, what, what's the largest cluster you've deployed with Nutanix? Um, so, so we've deployed um, uh, probably about a uh, eight to 16 node cluster, um, roughly uh, 100 nodes, more or less. So we have a lot of experience around the Nutanix okay. infrastructure. Yeah, I, there's some people that said, oh no, nobody goes more than eight nodes, and so you know, you're here saying that yes, you've done it, you know, works fine, not limitations, anything like that. Correct, and you know, you start to get in the classical debate of, of um, uh, 
separate clusters versus one homogenous cluster. You know, uh, uh, it's classic debate. What's the trade-off? What, what, help take us through that debate. So, so it's interesting because uh, when you start putting everything in one bucket, you start diluting cash, you start creating contention, you start getting the most unoptimal uh, uh, usage workload. Uh, other uh, environments can affect uh, workloads and you start losing control over that. On the flip side, if you segregate everything out, yes, you have 100% guarantee of that IO or CPU compute, but now you're at a cost point that's cost prohibitive. So um, uh, typically what I try to do from an enterprise perspective is weigh those um, uh, scale up, scale out, uh, uh, cluster approach is saying, what makes sense for the specific BUs? Are we talking a, um, a uh, financial application? Are we talking a logging application? Uh, put all those types of applications on a single cluster. Don't mix a corporate resource with a logging resource, right? So it, it, lots of those trade-offs and, and we uh, uh, work on those every day. Okay, so does, does Nutanix need more quality of service to be able to expand that into a larger pool or is, is that, that you know, is there something architecturally limiting it or is it, are we always going to have these trade-offs in your opinion? I think you're always going to have these trade-offs. Uh, uh, Nutanix does a great job in terms of tiering and, and IO prioritization. You can use things like VMware's um, 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 uh, groups, uh, priority groups to, to do IO limitations. But typically we let the apps try and determine themselves and then make sure that the apps are uh, uh, coalesced in a way that makes sense per cluster. So I wonder if we could um, come back to this notion of when you're, as an IT enterprise architect, how you go about things these days. You got, you heard, you were in the keynotes this morning, right? You heard the Gartner guy talking about mode one, mode two, IDCs, you know, platform two, platform three. Kind of superficial concepts, but they're good ones because Correct. they sort of describe what's happening, this bimodal notion. So what do you do as an architect? You got 90% of your revenue in most companies comes from the mode one. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody knows the grow the business. I'm, I'm running the business, that's where all my resources go. I want to grow the business, but I can't fund it. So how do you how do you approach that? How do you architect for the future? So, so I think the biggest thing that we are trying to do these days is show the cost of IT and the simplification of that. Um, historically, most enterprises have approached it via bolt-on. Uh, you'll, you'll see a lot of the uh, uh, software companies coming out trying to fix problems that are uh, band-aids on, on more core issues. Um, so the way we approach that is uh, uh, figure out what we're offsetting, figure out what infrastructure we're removing, figure out how we're actually saving the company money even though there's a spend there. Let me ask you a question. If, if, uh, if the CEO comes to you and says, Dan, I want to completely transform the company. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we know we have to, to compete. We have the, all these other forces. We're, we want to digitize our business. We got Uber coming after <laughs> us, right? I want to transform the company. And we don't, I don't want to take the band off slowly. I want to go hard, I want to go fast. Mm -hmm. and we're going to make IT the mainspring of mm -hmm. that transformation. How much money do you need? If, if, if he gave you all the money you needed, could you actually you know, transform the company more rapidly? Is budget a constraint to that transformation? Or is it just inertia of existing processes and skill sets? So I think there's a couple of things in that. Budget's always an issue, right? That's the reality of, of the world. Um, but but if, if somebody approached me and said, hey, we need to turn this thing on its head. We just can't keep executing uh, IT the way we've been doing it for the last X years. Uh, what do we do? Um, Virtualize everything. Uh, there are some exceptions, but virtualization first approach. Um, work with the developers, work with the, the manufacturers on how do you work with that scale out. Oracle's a great example, SQL Server's a great example. Uh, traditional uh, IT is a scale up approach. Um, it requires operations and uh, architects to work more closely with those product groups. Um, it's absolutely doable, and I think there's a lot of uh, politics and, and perhaps um, uh, animosity from changing from what is known to something that's unknown and, and relatively new. Uh, and I think breaking through those uh, emotional barriers generally is, is most of the fight in, in trying to get people to, to understand that. So VMware is obviously the dominant uh, virtualization platform. There are clearly others, Microsoft, Hyper-V gaining momentum, KVM, you know, pretty popular. You mentioned Oracle, mm -hmm. Oracle early on, you know, would 
fight tooth and nail, customers wanting to virtualize, you know, at Wikibon we told customers, damn the torpedoes, virtualize <laughs> Oracle. What's your experience been with virtualizing Oracle? So, outside of OVM, I should say, they're happy to take OVM. And, right. <laughs> you know, but. So, so I, I, it, it really comes down to working with the DBAs and understanding how to virtualize the database. Um, uh, Traditionally, people have come out and say, hey, we have a single database, we have a single data file, we have a single way of doing this. Um, and, and understanding what the data actually is in the database. Can you shard it? Can we start doing partitioning? What does that look like? Coming at it from a smaller node, but more scale out. Um, but that causes DBAs to have to rethink how they're doing data management. And that's scary because you're saying, hey, uh, you've been doing data management this way, we're going to completely redo that and start all over again. And most people aren't wanting to do that work. You know, right, wrong, or indifferent. Uh, so it's, it can be scary and somewhat threatening. Yeah. So Dan, Dave did an interview uh, about a year or so ago with CIO of Royal Phillips, and he said, I want to consume all of my IT you know, by the drink. It doesn't mean I'm pushing it all to public cloud, mm -hmm. but I want it all to be elastic. Uh, I, you know, I don't want to you know, do that huge CapEx outlay, as they say, and they're, they're, they're doing some interesting Hadoop applications. They do Oracle and SAP. Um, what's your take on that? And you know, I guess in, in that specifically. And also, how does how does public cloud cloud fit into your architecture? So, so the pay by the drink model is interesting in that when when companies are doing chargeback, how do you actually capture those costs? Uh, in my past, I've worked for public uh, public cloud companies, and that's a core business. If they don't do it well, the business fails. Um, so, really understanding the pay by the drink model. Uh, as it relates to charging back to the business, and what do those clusters look like? Um, from, from the second component is, is the management of that. How do you enable the business to do automation and, and uh, orchestration of the pay by the drink model? In some cases, on the flip side, you could say, hey, business unit, I'm just going to give you your own cluster, allow you to deploy your own uh, VMs and infrastructure. We're just going to make sure the infrastructure's running and, and healthy. Um, so I think there's trade-offs depending on the business and what, what the requirements are. Yeah, so, uh, you know, do you see IT pulling in that public cloud discussion or the business unit still kind of uh, doing a little bit of the rogue uh, stealth IT mode? I think I see both, right? So there's a case for public cloud, for example, uh, ADP, right? We're never going to do, um, uh, I, or I would never recommend a company doing payroll uh, in-house. Um, however, there are certain applications uh, that there's their core competency, uh, which should be in-house. And so I think there's actually a mix of both uh, in, the, in the sort of the new world. So can we talk about data protection? Mm -hmm. When the world moved to server virtualization, everybody realized well, <laughs> storage, doesn't like this, right? It broke storage and it broke backup. Mm -hmm. So a lot of customers re-architected their, their backup. Um, does hyper-converged, or whatever you want to call it, have a similar effect on, on the way in which you data, uh, protect data, or is it, was that more of a virtualization event? So, so I think we, you, when you talk data protection in a hyper-converged world, you're actually up-leveling the conversation in that historically, when you talk data protection, you talk about replicating a storage frame in some way and the quest in the app. In, in the Nutanix world, you're actually talking about the OS or the app. You're talking about application consistency. You're not thinking about the underlying fundamentals. And I think Nutanix has, has taken that with and say, hey, I want to protect this VM. We're not talking about LUNs. We're not talking about volume groups. Um, and it, and it up-levels the conversation that's more relevant to the business. Okay, right. so, so that would, sounds like a yes. Yeah. You, you <laughs> would look at, so is your advice to fellow practitioners to rethink backup and, 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 well, obviously you're a fan of <laughs> the whole hyper-converged thing generally and Nutanix specifically, but is part of the, the domino effect of rethinking backup? And, and I think not just backup, but a lot of the way uh, um, architecture and infrastructure is done, and backup is a component of that, and I, and I think that can be scary for enterprises because they have to rethink backups. They have to rethink how they're doing deployments, how they're doing clusters, how they're doing scale out, uh, and it, it can be a little bit scary, and, and I think most enterprises are want to understand more before they do so it. So carry that through a little bit more. What, what I'm, I'm going to push the advice button. What <laughs> would you advise in terms of all those factors? From an enterprise architect standpoint, you're coming in, Dan, the consultant, we're going to pay a bunch of dough to just tell us what we should be doing. Where do you start? 
Uh, understand what your requirements are, understand what your assumptions are, understand what your business is. Uh, moving beyond that, what is the ability to virtualize? Can you virtualize your infrastructure? If so, what does your growth rates look like? If you're flat, um, uh, how does that affect your infrastructure? So really understand the business before you get down into the bits and bytes of it um, and, and, and build the requirements and assumptions out of that. All right, so, so Dan, uh, you know, you've mentioned virtualization a lot. Curious what your take is on the whole containerization discussion. Docker. Yeah, Docker, CoreOS <laughs> is also yep. uh, you know, a, a partner and in that space, so um, you know, where are you with the containers? Where, where do you see that fitting? You know, bare metal, mm -hmm. you know, virtualization, cloud, everything. So I, I think Docker and containerization has been, uh, is, has been fantastic in the industry. Uh, from the perspective of a developer being able to do a CRUD environment very fast without having to build an entire heavy VM out of that has been hugely transformational. Uh, I think there's some concerns around the management, the deployment, the security, just like OpenStack, right? It's, it's getting there, a big fan of OpenStack, but they still have a lot of hurdles to, to get through. Um, things like PCI come to mind, right? When you've got compliance and regulatory, uh, whether it's HIPAA or other, uh, how does that work in? And so I think Docker and containers are sort of their infancy, uh, where Compliance regulations maybe are a little more lax, or they're more heavy. I think it requires enterprises to do a little bit more homework and, yeah, and take yeah. a more. I, I mean, today we're mostly stateless apps, so you right. know, get into some of the heavy duty, you know, GRC compliance, right. uh, PCI, everything. It's a little bit early. So uh, agreed. According to Mark Hurd last year at Oracle Open World, might have been two years ago. The, the shows are flying by here in <laughs> the cube, but he said the average age of the enterprise app is 19 years. Wow. Now. Sounds about right. That could be one of those numbers like, you know, 70% of our spend goes to keeping the lights on, who knows. But it feels about right. You mm -hmm. know, that's not a surprising statistic. And maybe that's maybe that needle has moved a little bit, but the average enterprise app is pretty old. Yeah. Claims apps, you know, payroll apps, etc. What do you see the world looking like seven years down the road in terms <laughs> of IT infrastructure? How would you describe it? I think you're going to see a, a, a huge shift where sort of the SMEs fade off into the distance. Uh, you're going to have a generic platform that's more f focused on services and service availability than infrastructure. Um, uh, Hardware is going to come in and out, um, but, but at the end of the day, uh, IT is going to be more worried about service delivery. And you're starting to see some of that today with uh, even public cloud uh, email offerings and, and whatnot. All right, so D Dan, want to you know take out your magic wand? <laughs> you know, you talked about a lot of the things you like. You know, what still is you know difficult in your job that you know you really need the vendors out there to make invisible, make it simple, mm -hmm. um, that would you know make your life and your peers' uh, lives easier. Um, I, I <laughs> it's a good question. So, um, I, I think a lot of the um, adoption is uh, based around other people's experiences. So having other people who are running Oracle Rack and virtualization uh, on uh, Nutanix or other hardware, um, being able to get that broad industry adoption, I think helps shift those, those uh, opinions and, and uh, conversations. Hi, right, Tim. Well, listen, we have to leave it there. Thanks very much for coming Thank on theCUBE. Great insights from an uh, enterprise architect, an IT expert. Uh, Stu and I are very pleased to have you on, Thank so you. thanks again. All right, keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back from Miami. This is theCUBE. We're live at dot next, hashtag next, <laughs> conf. Got it? Is that right, Stu? You okay. got it, Dave. Finally, after four hours of broadcasting, I get the conference name correct. Keep it right there, everybody. We'll be right back. <laughs>